This is Who Makes a Podcast. Conversations with your favorite podcast hosts about who they are, the shows they make, and why they make them. I'm your host, Chris Cookley, and my guest today is Mike Darling. Mike Makeshift Darling is a filmmaker currently residing in Nashville, Tennessee. He's the creator of the audio drama Legends of Wasteland City and the podcast and YouTube channel The Apocalypse Post. He also has been the video crew lead for the post-apocalypse festival Wasteland Weekend for over a decade. I met Mike at a podcaster meetup back in November, and I could tell right away that he was someone I needed to have on my podcast. The work he does is really quality stuff, and I knew that there would be a lot for me and then you to learn from him. On this episode, we talk about Wasteland Weekend and the lore that Mike's podcast is based on, his voice acting, and then his recording of other voice actors, dealing with mouth noise during recording, something that we can all relate to, I'm sure, writing and plotting a fictional story as a podcast, finding realistic sound effects to use for free online, and why Mike doesn't like the gold standard Shure SM7B for his audio dramas. There's so much more to this conversation, and for the full show notes and links to everything we talk about in this episode, go to whomakesapodcast.com slash e25. And now here is my conversation with Makeshift. Mike, welcome to Who Makes a Podcast. Hi, Chris. Thanks so much for having me on. I'm excited to talk to you. We met... This is December. We're rec- well, no, it's not December. I guess it's the end of November. We're recording this. Yeah, we met a couple of weeks ago um, <laughs> at the Nashville Podcasters Meetup, which was my first time attending the Nashville Podcasters Meetup. Have you been to that meetup before, or was that your first time as well? I didn't realize that was your first one. Yeah, I've been going for the better part of a year now. Oh, awesome. Yeah, and I've, I heard about it a long time ago, and it was just, I, I was just waiting for the right opportunity to show up, which that opportunity was just to show up, I guess. Yeah. Um, but yeah, what a great group. It's a bunch of Nashville podcasters who get together and kind of share insights. It's got a couple of amazing leaders that are, uh, they have incredible podcasts themselves. Uh, they're podcast producers themselves. And so they're always giving incredibly, incredibly valuable information every week or every month. I guess it's monthly. So I guess it's not every week, but <laughs> yeah, it, it is monthly. And I, I joined apparently at, uh, a wrong, not a wrong time, not, not a bad time even, but, um, we had a meetup in November and then they're, they're taking December off. So I got a taste of it in November and it was fantastic. And then, you know, immediately it's, it's all right, we'll wait two months for the next one. (laughs) Yeah. I can't wait for the next one. It's become like one of my favorite days of the month is when the podcasters get together. What else have they done in the, uh, in the past that, that you've been a part of for that? Like this past meetup, we did a, a podcast audit, which was really cool, but it seemed, sounded like that was the first time they had done that. So what else, what other kinds of things have they done? Yeah. So they've done lots of different cool stuff. A couple months ago, they had a guy come in and just talked about like um, sound treating a room, which was pretty cool. Uh, he actually was representing one of the companies that makes sound treatment, so it was a bit of like a like a, a little bit I of self promotion there, a, a little bit of a corporate handshake yeah. right there. Um, but there's been weeks when other podcasters have talked about making an audio drama, which was a very good week for me. They've had like a more technical side of things. Uh, one of the guys brought in. Oh boy, probably two dozen mics and and half a dozen uh, audio. What are they called? Audio system things. The the inter the interface intermix thing. Or... The interface. Thank you. Okay. That's the word I was looking for. Uh, and we get to test a bunch of different mics and different interfaces going into the computer and hear how each one was affecting our voices. Uh, so that was a lot of fun. That that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, I obviously you know if you're in the Nashville area and you're listening, definitely come to the next Nashville Podcasters Meetup. If you're not in the Nashville area, maybe, you know, maybe try to find a uh, podcast meetup of your own because they're, they definitely seem like really cool sort of things that people can uh, participate in and meet other podcasters. Like I met Mike here and now, you know, you're a guest on my podcast, which is awesome. Yeah. And the, the meetup is really extra special for podcasting because, all right, so I'm also a filmmaker. And when you, when you go to filmmakers meetups, it's like, it's even a more social version of the social thing you're already doing because filmmaking takes a lot of people. Right. And 
uh, like actors and musicians get to meet all the time during workshops and practices and whatever they're doing. Uh, but podcasters, we pretty much just do our own thing in our homes or our small studios by ourselves. Right. And we don't really get that same interaction that a lot of other artists get. And so, uh, it's, it's it's even more important to like take that step and get together with people that are doing the same thing and see what everyone can learn from each other. Yeah, it was, it was an excellent experience and I, I will be going back for sure. So as you said, you are a filmmaker and you know, I think you have from, from what I saw on your website, a, a lot of experience with that, like over, over a decade maybe, but now you're making a podcast. I assume you're still doing the film, but you're also making a podcast. So what is it about podcasting that you found interesting enough that you thought, you know, I, I have this visual medium that I'm doing. I'm, I'm making cool videos, but I also want to get into the, the audio stuff. What is it about that that brought you into that? Yeah, so I, I know we're going to get into a bunch of this later, but I, I've been making short videos for a long time. And some of that is like regular old short films. I also do a bunch of post-apocalypse stuff. Uh, and so I'd been doing a lot of that on my YouTube, but with COVID, uh, along with everyone else, I said, well, I, I don't have new footage but I can get in a room and talk for a while. Yeah. Now, one of the things that kind of inspired me is um, the festival Wasteland Weekend that I'm sure we'll get into later. You know, when we would hang out on like a Zoom call or something, people would just start telling all these stories of like festivals in the past. And here's some, here's how some cosplay, not cosplay, but like some, uh, some role play or some improv went wrong. And how funny was that? And uh, I noticed that these stories in the round I really enjoyed hearing them, and I thought other members of that community would like to hear them too. And so the very first episodes were actually just me getting together with some other Wastelanders and, you know, telling stories kind of in the round and uh, just kind of seeing how that went. Yeah. So I feel like we should probably just get into that right now then, since <laughs> I'm not familiar with Wasteland Weekend, and I know you're, you're, you're talking about it, you're throwing some terms out. I, I'm yeah. familiar roughly-ish, I guess, with the with the concept after doing some research on you, but Legends of Wasteland City is your podcast. It's based on the world, the lore of Wasteland Weekend. Before we talk about the podcast, you know, what what is Wasteland Weekend? What are you what are you building off of here? Yeah. So I got involved with Wasteland Weekend well over a decade ago. Like it's not well over a decade. It's just about a decade ago. Uh, in 2011 was, was my first event and Wasteland Weekend. All right. So a lot of people have heard of Burning Man Yes. Uh, or may have been to like a music festival where there's camping involved, that kind of thing. And Wasteland Weekend is that kind of a thing, except there's only one theme and that theme is the post-apocalypse, which in this case, it's very Mad Max based but yep. they do kind of like, you know, the, the edges fray a little bit into like Fallout and Borderlands. Um, although they have very specific rules. No aliens, no ray guns, no zombies, <laughs> no mutants, right? It's <laughs> it's a very Mad Maxian track. Just some other stuff that does fit into that. But yeah, it's a, it's a week-long festival. Everyone has to dress up, so it's completely immersive. They split the event into general camping where kind of anything goes, well, not anything, but either normal real world stuff or post-apocalypse. And then there's the city, which is 100% themed, no modern cars, no Coleman tents, no coolers. Uh, you got to hide all that or decorate it. And so when you're in that area of the city, you feel like you are in either a Mad Max movie or right in a post-apocalyptic video game. So it's been a big part of my life for the last decade. And are people living in the city area during the week or are they like they're there during the day, their their shops open or whatever it is, and then at night they go back out to their campsite or their RV or, or whatever, or are they, they're staying in that city area? Yeah, so um, a lot of people get together in one theme camp and form what's called a tribe. And that tribe would be like a single theme. So like my tribe is the Dukes of the Nuke, where this like Vietnam era ex-military gun running tribe, but, you know, kind of take the Vietnam era and push it 50 years into the apocalypse, right? Okay. So so we, we still hold on to that theme, but now it's, you know, the world has ended. And then there's another tribe called the Skullduggers, and they're kind of like this berserker tribe. You know, they're bad guys. Uh, and then there's some survivor tribes that have kind of picked up on like the green place of the new Mad Max Fury Road. And they kind of have more of like a survivalist crafters kind of area. And so the city is made up of these tribes that have all built these themed camps, kind of one after another, right down Main Street. And there's several blocks of these like you know, just kind of dot them one after another. And so those tribes, they, they live in the city for five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 days, depending okay. on how long they're there. And then 
uh, most of the people that live out in what we call tent city, which is general camping, they'll come in, hang out for the day, uh, stick around for the party at night, and then they'll go sleep in their tents back out in tent city. So how many people are coming to this? Well, it peaked in 2019 before the pandemic hit with about 5,200 people. This year, which the last event just happened in September, was I think about 3,800. Although they, I don't think they've given official numbers yet, but that's what I've heard wow. uh, through, through, my, through my channels so far. Uh, so yeah, it's a rather small festival, but it feels huge when you're there. And where is it? Where does it take place? It takes place in Southern California, about two hours north of LA. If you're familiar with Edwards Air Force Base... It's uh, kind of right on the border. It's just north of Edwards Air Force Base. Okay. So it's in the middle of the desert, and uh, yep. it's actually on the on the uh, southwest southwest corner of the Mojave Desert, which is very famous for being pretty damn dead. Yeah. And so when you're at the festival, you look around 100 and, you know, 360 degrees, you don't see anything. There's nobody out there, so it really feels like you're the last survivors. This may be a, a dumb question because I'm not in this post-apocalyptic <laughs> world. I'm not, I'm not <laughs> familiar. The deep dive today. Yeah, I'm not familiar with the the lore and the history and and the stories. And I haven't actually seen Mad Max. I've heard it's <gasps> a really good movie, but I've never seen yeah. it. Yeah, I've seen clips, and it it does seem like it's always a desert. Yeah. So, like, is there a reason for that, or could you have a post-apocalyptic world that's set in a rainforest? Well, Mad Max, the originals all take place in Australia. And so, you know, the big thing in the Australian outback is outside of the coasts, it's pretty much desert. Like it's not a very mm -hmm. habitable island. And so I think that's where a lot of it comes from. But then also the idea of the desert kind of blooming where there once, where there once was forests or there once was an ocean or a lake uh, is pretty common in post-apocalyptic culture because, you know, let's say the, if you're talking about a nuclear apocalypse, you know, nothing can grow. And so over okay. time you would just end up with sand. And that kind of goes with a lot of different scenarios is just, it's not so much the desert. It's just a lack of water and a lack of life. Yeah. Uh, and, and what you end up with kind of looks a lot like a desert. I mean, that's, that's tracking. I feel like if I, uh, you know, nobody knows what they would actually do in that situation. Right. But I feel <laughs> right. like if I was in that situation, I'd be like, this desert freaking sucks. And I'm going to go try to find there's got to be a bush somewhere right like, right yeah totally gotta be a tree somewhere still the fallout video games have played with it a lot more they they've had um fallout new vegas which is actually in the same area as wasteland it's between basically la and las vegas but then they've also done east coast um apocalypses which are a little bit more green you know some trees are surviving and a whole new breed of like greenery is there too yeah uh, but yeah, so it can be a little bit green, but the whole idea is just, you know, in any kind of post-apocalypse story, the population has dwindled and yeah. life is a lot harder. All right. So you started this Legends of Wasteland City because of COVID. Had you thought about doing a podcast before? Have you tried other podcasts in the past or is this the first one? Yeah. So, so I actually started with one other one. Uh, it's called Man Area. And actually we still trickle out an episode every now and then, although it's slowed down quite a bit. Um, but that's actually with my buddy, Kalen Chase. Now, Kalen is actually a musician. Uh, he toured with Korn. He was a guitarist for Korn oh, wow. for four or five years. Uh, he's lived like this rock star lifestyle yeah. and is now here in Nashville kind of doing his own project. It's very indie, but indie rock. Some really cool stuff if you get a chance to check him out. Hold on, hold on. Musician moved to Nashville? Yeah, I know. You could, could never believe it, right? Shocking. <laughs> yeah. And... Um, he is, there's no better word for it. He's like sparky. Like he is, he's funny. He's crass. He's got something to say about everything. And it's probably going to offend some people, but he always does it with like kind of the best at heart. And he's yeah. honestly like a super open-minded. Um, he's very accepting of anything, but he'll just kind of, you know, joke about things that most people would find a little, you know, taboo. And so I said, Hey dude, it, you know, let's, let's get together. We'll just hang out, get to know each other. Uh, but we're, we're going to record it. And my job is to just keep you talking. So I would kind of just interview him every episode about mm -hmm. whatever topic we came up with for that week. That's awesome. So Man Area, that's the name of that podcast. You're still kind of making some episodes every so often, it sounds like. Yeah, very sporadic. Do you listen to a lot of podcasts? I do. I love, I love listening to podcasts. Yeah. They are my go-to when I'm driving because, you know, I'm, I'm kind of sick of listening to the same music all the time. Sure. Uh, and honestly, finding good music is almost tougher than ever. There's more music than ever, yeah. but finding the stuff that's going to really hit you is, is harder than ever. That signal to noise. 
Yeah, exactly. So who are you listening to as far as podcasts goes? Who are your, who are your go-tos? Well, what actually got me into podcasts was all the great NPR shows. So yes. I got to admit, like, those are some of the ones that I keep going back to. Like, um, They're the best produced, too. Oh, oh my gosh, yeah. Like, <laughs> they know what they're doing. Yeah, Stuff You Should Know, um, yep. uh, Radio Lab, This American Life. Like, those are all my go-tos for sure. Mm-hmm. I was listening to um, Mike Rowe for a bit, but his new format I'm not crazy about. We seem to be on a, a very similar podcast track, <laughs> honestly. <laughs> and then, um, actually, one of my favorites, of course, everyone loves Conan. Conan's a hilarious show. But my buddies have a show called Shooting the Shit, which there's a lot of shows called Shooting the Shit. Uh, theirs has an exclamation point for the I and shit. Oh, okay. Um, and they are hilarious. They're just a couple of guys that, you know, grew up in the same town. Both They moved apart, uh, and they just talk about work and stuff. But they are so funny. They're honestly one of my favorite shows, and I think I'm one of, like, 12 people listening. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but they're hilarious. My buddy Dave, he's always got some horror story. And sometimes it's about his health, which is a little unfortunate, but he makes the best of it. Yeah. Uh, and then he talks about work and like all these crazy things happen. It's like, like he's driving down the road and he legit sees a ghost cross the street. Like he is 100% convinced that a spirit crossed his path. Uh, and that episode was hilarious. And then the one where there was a homeless guy out by the garbage can uh, <laughs> and, <laughs> and why he keeps nunchucks by the back door now is, is I mean, they're hilarious. Anyway. Yeah, I'll have to, I'll have to check that out. It's funny stuff. <laughs> All right. So you, you're making a podcast now. Yeah. And before you did the podcast, while you're doing the podcast, I know that you have also been a voice actor and it, it definitely comes through on your podcast. I think I told you when we met in person that your your narration on your podcast honestly sounds like it could be on Audible. Like it's it's that like professional level uh, of, of audiobook. How did you get into voice acting? Like what do you do as far as that is concerned? Well, thanks so much for saying that. Um, so it's interesting. I'm not actually a voice actor outside okay. of mostly my own projects, but so I've been making films for a long time. And, and when it comes down to it, you know, I need a quick voiceover for this short film I'm doing or for yeah, this commercial yeah. I'm doing. Uh, the easiest one to go to is me. Uh, and so I would just do it. But over time, uh, I've learned quite a bit. And one of the greatest parts of that is uh, my best friend that we go all the way back to high school kind of I went into more production stuff and he ended up in what voiceover okay and so he's been training at at voiceover for oh shoot almost well probably over a decade give or take uh, he's super accomplished he actually plays uh, several of the characters on Legends of Wasteland City uh, specifically he's playing um, zealot in uh, the the story that I'm working on right now, which is called The Ones Who Came Before, and I'm actually just editing his demise, uh, which is really fun. So he's been in my head like all day. <laughs> but yeah, so he, we would hang out and he would give me a few tips and tricks and he would have me audition for some stuff that he was working on mm-hmm. um, or some open auditions that, you know, he just kind of wanted to help his friends get a shot at. Uh, and so he would give me some tricks along the way and and it's, I guess it's been helpful because... I've, I've heard some wonderful comments like yours, like yours that uh, make me feel like I must be doing something right. Yeah. It, it, I wish I had a clip queued up to play because I, I haven't done that on this podcast. Maybe I'll interject something, but it, it just, it sounds so good. Like, Thank you. <laughs> the narration sounds fantastic. I don't know if it's the music bed that you're putting under it or just your enunciation and, and you know, how you're projecting. But yeah, it sounds, it sounds great. Oh, I appreciate that. Sometimes it's, it's tough because like these last couple episodes, I just recorded uh, episodes nine and 10 and they are the longest ones. And my voice, I don't, I don't talk a whole lot in the real world. Yeah. Like I'm, I'm pretty quiet overall. And so he, already my voice is starting to get worn out just from this interview that we're only 20 minutes into. Um, and <laughs> so I'll be recording this narration and to record a 20 minute narration takes over an hour. Sure. Because you, I need to do at least two takes of everything, and I'm messing up a lot, stumbling on my words. Uh, and, of course, I'm sure a lot of podcasters have this same problem I do. I have a lot of mm-hmm. mouth noise. And so I got to go back and re-record stuff all the time, You know, be sipping on my water, have my apple juice nearby. Does that actually work? I've heard that before. Does the apple, yeah. does the apple stuff actually work? I don't know if it works. <laughs> Somebody said on a, on a previous episode to eat a green apple before you... Do yeah. voice recording. A green one specifically. 
yeah, uh, something to do with the acids or I don't know. Um, mostly, you know, hydrating before you record, I think is the biggest thing. Yeah. And just being aware of it. Like when I'm aware of it, my mouth is much more open when I'm talking and I'm not smacking my lips right after I stop talking. But yeah, so I'm recording for an hour. My voice can get worn out and um, I'm still learning how to keep that fresh as I'm recording. Yeah. So Legends of Wasteland City is the name of your podcast. As we said, it's based on the Wasteland Weekend Festival. Would you call it a festival? Is it a festival? Yeah, I think it's a, fe- it's a festival. Yeah. It's an event. Okay. It's a, well, what else is it? It's kind of, you know, it's a music festival. It's an arts festival. Uh, it's a camping weekend. And, and um, it's not a LARP and it's also not not a LARP. Yep. <laughs> For anyone that's familiar with LARPs, that's uh, live action role play. And if you go to an actual LARP event chances are pretty good you're going to be in character the whole time but yeah it's not quite that so people do role play but they kind of role play briefly and then get back out of it uh it's really just kind of a way to hang out and do some art stuff and have some fun hey it's chris can i jump in here for a minute and ask if you have thought about making your own podcast if you have you may have realized there's a lot more that goes into it than you might have thought don't worry i have a gift for you I want you to have my podcast quick start checklist. From what microphone and recording software you should use to how you host and distribute your show, I'm here to help with all of that and more. My podcast quick start checklist will walk you through everything you need to know to start your podcast. I'll show you what's actually important. To get my podcast quick start checklist, Go to whomakesapodcast.com slash start and tell me where to send it. Now let's get back to the episode. Is the concept of Wasteland Weekend, is that like an open source thing? There's not like one main, this is the story of Wasteland Weekend guy or, or is any of it like copyrighted? Like you're, you're making up your own stories based yeah. on that. So how does that work? Right. Okay. So. The guidelines, and this goes all the way back to my first event in 2011. It may have even been in 2010, but I wouldn't know that part. But um, Jared, who's one of the co-owners, he he said, you know, our idea of Wasteland is in the apocalypse, once a year, all these tribes get together just to celebrate another year of being alive. And so the idea would be that this would just be like um, a big bartering festival, a, a gathering of the survivors once a year to eat, drink, barter, find mates, uh, you know, kind of whatever uh, makes sense in a post-apocalyptic world. And through that, that, that very same year, they introduced the idea of tribes and, and how, you know, there's going to be these people with a common theme that all have their own backstory. They can be from anywhere. And the cool thing was, you know, just because one tribe says we own, like, say the area of Los Angeles, our tribe is from Los Angeles. That doesn't mean another tribe can't. A lot of things overlap kind of in the spirit of Mad Max. It's all a little bit wishy-washy. Like, you know, Mad Max doesn't have a real timeline. It's more just like legends that get, get, that get told. Uh, And Wasteland picked up a lot on that. And so over the years, these tribes have come up with their own backstory, their own lore. And year after year, as the tribes interact, Uh, more lore gets written. And the lore is just kind of our own stories that we tell each other. And so I kind of picked up on that. There was a tribe, they're called uh, Schofield's Drifters. Uh, Some really great people. They put on a really good camp. And they actually wrote out their stories in uh, like novel form, like novella, short stories. But it was written like a book. And I thought that was really cool because it was fun to read and it was really well constructed. And I'm just reading one of them. And I said, oh man, this, this would be really cool to actually have voice actors play these parts and narrate the parts, you know, the, the actual readings, and then maybe even add, I don't know, maybe a couple sound effects, maybe a little bit of music and just see how it goes. And so I asked them for permission they, they, and they happily granted it. And I did one of their very short stories, a very simple story, and I did it in the full production that I do for Legends of Wasteland City. And it worked and people got behind it and they really enjoyed it. And so then I said, you know, do you have any more? And so they sent me back a six chapter, like short story. Uh, and that's where I got started. So it was like a, 
a proof of concept, almost a prototype of what the podcast was going to be that, that first short story narration. Yeah, exactly. Well, cause cool. I, I needed to know exactly how much work was going to go into this thing yeah. and yeah. how many people were going to listen. Yeah. <laughs> but because I have this built in audience of wastelanders that are already invested in these stories, right. you know, they, they actually really enjoy listening and sharing and being a part of it, which is pretty cool. And in the, in the wasteland world, you go by makeshift, right? That's your name. So where does that come from? Yeah, that's right. Well, I don't really have a cool origin story for that. Other than I was doing my YouTube channel, which is called the apocalypse post kind of like the post apocalypse, just swap those last two words around. (laughs) And at first I was going by mad Mike and mad Mike. Uh, spoke with an Australian From Australia, accent, yeah. Uh, kind of playing on the Mad Max thing, right? But uh, trying to be Mad Mike. But what I realized was a few things. One, my accent wasn't that good, uh, and <laughs> <laughs> and especially like you know, if I'm just improvising with a couple of people, a couple of blokes, as it were, right? Right. Um, uh, I can you know fool around with it enough to pass. But once I'm working with scripted stuff, it just fell apart, which was really interesting. Yeah. Uh, one of, one of my episodes on this podcast was with a couple of guys called the crafty rogues. And one of them is from Ireland and one of them is from Australia. Oh, and fun. It, it, it was awesome. Like we, we signed on and he, uh, immediately the Australian was like, good eye, good eye, good eye. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> That's hilarious. It was, it, it was an awesome interview. Those guys are fantastic. Oh, nice. Yeah, I'm going to check that one out. should bring back the uh, the Australian accent. Yeah, I should bring it back? No. Yeah. No. It's, well, I'll bring it back when it needs it. Uh, you know what? Maybe I'll write a character <laughs> in the future. That's there Australian. There you go. There you go. <laughs> but the second thing was, you know, a quick Google showed that there are a lot of guys in the world calling themselves Mad Mike. Uh, and I wanted something a little bit more original. So... Still in my Australian accent, I hadn't switched back to my regular, you know, speech yet. Uh, Mike shift, Mike starts with Mike, Mike mm. shift, right? So I was, I was, I found a, a a name that I would recognize if people called me it. There you go. If okay. that makes any sense, yeah. yeah. And I just kind of, you know, and honestly, I'm a very makeshift guy. I can build things and I can make things, but I tend to shortcut it wherever possible. <laughs> <laughs> Unlike what I do on the podcast, which... Yeah, no, the podcast sounds very well produced. Yeah, I do this, this is just the opposite. I go way too far yeah. on the podcast. <laughs> no, the, uh, the the podcast is fantastic. So maybe we should talk about, you know, the the podcast itself now. So it's presented as a, a series of stories, each episode kind of being a chapter in that story, if you will. And yeah. you write the stories, you know... What, what is your script writing process? Are you, and, and specifically, I guess I'm, I'm wondering about like plot and arc and character development and things. Are yeah. you, are you writing out the entire eight, 10, 12 episode script all at once so that you can get these, these arcs nailed down? Are you doing it kind of one at a time? Or yes. How are you approaching that? Yeah. So I'll start by saying, um, the first season is three stories and the first one was the Schofield Strifter story. So that's six chapters. I didn't write that. They, they had that all finished and all I did was go through and kind of like make a few changes, right? Mm-hmm. Because I don't need all the, he said, he said, she said's because they're saying them, the characters are saying them so I can get right. rid of those. Uh, but sometimes I need to reference different things. So it just takes a little bit of editing to make it ready for the podcast. And then the second one is actually a, a story from another tribe called Rabbit Asylum, and it's a bit of an origin story, and it's actually first person, so I had an actress that read the entire thing, and that was just one chapter. But the third story is the one that I've written. It's my original story, and it's called The Ones Who Came Before, uh, and that one is where 8.1, because there's a bonus episode, episodes or chapters out of 10 that are complete. I'm working on 9 and 10 right now as we speak. Actually, I, I stopped editing and started setting up for tonight, but I'm hoping to get those done <laughs> Uh, in the next couple of weeks. But anyway, yeah, so the writing process, I pretty much had, let's see, I think I had about six chapters written before I started working on the first one. And even with the six written, I had through nine kind of plotted out. I knew how this was going to end. And so, I, you know, it's, it's a lot easier to know how to write when you know where you're going. And I would just continually make small changes as I was recording. And as the voice actors do their parts, sometimes that makes me need to like, you know, make small adjustments. One very specific one is for chapter nine, which is coming out soon. Zealot, the voice actor, uh, who's Jay Preston, he 
recorded a part that I wanted yelled, but he kind of did it quietly. But all I'm going to do is change my narration a little bit to have him speaking through a, a megaphone. And so I can actually adjust his voice louder while still keeping his performance this really cool, uh, quiet, brooding okay. kind of performance. Uh, and it, it, it honestly sounds really cool. And all you have to do is yeah. change a couple lines in the narration. Yeah. So what's really interesting is I actually wrote a very short story, I think maybe a page or two. Yep. And it would have played out over the course of two, maybe three minutes tops. That was about um, this lead character, Mutt, and his adventures uh, trying to steal something from a raider tribe and bring it back to his home at the Dukes of the Nuke. And I've been kind of sitting on that script for a bit. It was actually going to be a short, short film, but that never came to fruition. And I was looking for you know, a story of my own to write. And I said, well, let me go check out some of these old scripts. And sure. that was the first one I really wanted to work on because it involves so many characters that are actually from Wasteland Weekend. It's the Dukes of the Nuke. So I, I knew that I had all these characters that were already involved, and I thought it would be really cool to kind of tie things together as much as possible with the story. And I started writing, and I thought it was going to be like a three or four chapter thing, and it just kept going, and I kept adding more and more until it ended up as this 10 chapter. I mean, when I'm done, oh my gosh, it's going to be like <laughs> two hours plus of audio yeah. or something like that. It's yeah. crazy. No, that's, I mean, that's like a movie, right? That's, yeah. That's awesome. I did hear on a uh, an episode that I just finished listening to, is either the second or the third chapter, you were talking about people were asking for longer stories. And I, I completely understand why when you make them, they're like eight to 12 to 15 minutes or whatever it is long that the actual, the audio story is because that's, I mean, it's a ton of work and it's yeah. a ton of writing and editing and, and you got voice actors and stuff and, right. and you're, you're going up against, I mean, potentially like the NPRs of the world that are, are making, you know, 45 minute long episodes that are built out like that. But like, as you said, when you listen to the credits on those episodes, there's 40 oh people gosh, working on yeah. that, right? And you're you're kind of a one-man person. Yeah, I mean, the the host of those shows gets a lot of credit because they're the voice, right? Right. But, but like, they're not producing every no. episode. And if they're, even perf- if they're even producing one story in that episode, it's rare. Yeah, so you're, you're as, a, as an independent podcaster like myself, you're, you're <laughs> doing the job of a lot of people. And it's interesting. A lot of people ask me, you know, how long does it take to produce an episode? And when I started with the Apocalypse Postcast, which is kind of the, the, the story kind of telling and interview one that I, I started with. Yep. And this is still in the Apocalypse Postcast family because it's hosted there. But those episodes take about a day. To produce, it's um, you know you you schedule your people, you set your time to record, and then between editing and publishing, it's about a day of work. Now, audio dramas, I think I've estimated it at four to five days to produce an episode that's fifteen minutes long, which yeah. is pretty nuts. So yeah, it's it's five hundred percent of the work to do to get a fifth, if not less, <laughs> of the of the content. Um, but I love it. it. It takes me back to filmmaking when I was first making yeah. web series back in LA in t- 2008. It's, it's, it's so much fun. And I, I do love narrative storytelling more than I love interviewing. Although I, I love making documentaries too. I, 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 I can't, I can't say that I don't. <laughs> well, as somebody who has, you know, dabbled in fiction writing before you, you have absolutely piqued my interest as far as what I can do with another podcast. If I had thought about expanding to another podcast and I might at some point, I might try to mm-hmm. pursue something like this. I don't know if I would want to go with voice actors just because I feel like that must add a, a whole nother level of complexity to making it, but maybe one of those audio dramas where you're, you're literally just narrating everything that happens. I feel like that could be a lot of fun as like a side project. Yeah. Well, as I was um, trying to figure out what my show would sound like, I was listening to a lot of shows and um, there are some audio dramas out there that are 100% cast with no narrator, but they'll still have sound effects and music. And I really enjoy that, but honestly, I actually have a hard time following along sometimes because the narrator can just tell you exactly what's happening rather than one of the characters having to be like, oh my gosh, look in the sky, there is a spaceship coming towards us. Yeah. Because the narrator can just say, and a spaceship was hurtling toward them. And then the, the, the characters can stay more natural. Uh, and then on the other side of that, there's a web series out there, I'm sorry, a podcast out there. And I don't, I don't know if he's still producing, but it's called Ash Tales and it's another post-apocalypse uh, anthology where each week is its own short story. And that's just narrator. And I thought that was pretty good. But for me, it was all about making it 
as much like a movie as possible. And that, you know, in my interpretation, still means narrator kind of explaining yep. the action while the characters get to just act, if that makes sense. And how are you how are you finding like the voice actors that you're working with? Are these people that you already know? Or are you going on like Fiverr? Or I, I'm, <laughs> I have, I'm so ignorant to this process. How are you finding your, your talent? Yeah, so uh, I'm lucky enough to have a great circle of friends that are all really talented. And um, there's threefold. I've had several of my professional voice acting friends help. Uh, that Jay is one of them, his, his wife, uh, our friend Michael, they've all done voice acting in the past and we're happy to jump on board for this. Uh, another group is, I have a bunch of friends here in Nashville and since I can just sit down with them face to face, a lot yeah. of them are musicians, they already know how to use their voice and all I have to do is kind of like coach them a little bit into the acting part of it. And the last group, this one's kind of cool, a lot of the characters in these stories are based on real people's wasteland weekend personas mm -hmm. and so in a lot of cases i've actually just shipped out a microphone or they have a microphone that they uh, can use and they voice their own character which i think is really cool are they asking you for like edit rights on their lines like are they trying to <laughs> are they trying well, to dictate well my character wouldn't say that well i usually tell them you know make it sound like you so feel free to make adjustments give me what's yeah. on the paper as one but then kind of improvise whatever you want because when they improvise, I get great stuff. Yeah. But sometimes, but sometimes the line is very specific, and it has, you know, some things that are going to come up later. So I need the exact words. And in a lot of cases, I can take their improv and you know edit it together with the line I need in order to get the best of both worlds. They have to feel so excited to be involved in that process. Like it's it's a fictional character that they've created, but it's kind of real. Like it's kind of part of them and and probably yeah. kind of part of who they are and you're, you're helping bring it to life in this other world that exists only, only in the podcast, which is cool. Totally. Yeah. And the, and kind of the cool thing was, you know, I, I wrote this lore, this story without really involving many of them. I don't write with people very well. <laughs> I'll no, admit that. Neither. I kind of me need to do my own thing. Uh, just yeah. kind of go where the story takes me and just kind of rely on that same thing of like, you know, this is one story. This is one bit of like legend that may or may not be true uh, along with the rest of the show. So, you know, just because I'm writing it down doesn't mean that this is anyone's like backstory. And, you know, I did put up the whole manuscript, well, chapters one through nine that were done at the time. And I said, hey, if anyone has any notes on, you know, your character, if I'm doing anything wrong, that's kind of against the tribe's background, just let me know and yeah. I'll fix it. And everyone was just like, no, this is great. Keep going. Cool. Yeah. And when you're recording your voice actors, and you're, um, specifically the, the local people, you're sounds like you're sitting down in person, you're doing a recording session with them. Is that kind of just like a, a relaxing hangout thing for you guys? I mean, the, the episodes that I've heard, there are voice actors in them, mm -hmm. but there are not a lot of lines. Some of them only have like two lines, right? Right. Yeah. Some of the episodes are very narrator driven, but then... Maybe I just haven't gotten to the, the other ones that... Uh, yeah. Yeah. Keep going. It does tend to be like, you know, there'll be a lot of like story and, and, yeah. and kind of like placing the characters here or there. And then, you know, every now and then I'll just have a scene that's just, just dialogue. Yeah. So how are you doing those recording sessions and they're, they're coming over to your place. You're going over to there. Yeah. So it's been a mix so far. Um, let's see. I, I do have a friend that has a studio here in town. So, uh, her name's Mallory. She actually has a, a spot in, what is it? Not the Studio B building, but RCA. It's in the same building as Studio B, but I think it's actually right below it. And so she's offered up her studio a couple times to record her lines, which she played Zinn. And she's also recorded a couple other characters there as well, which has been awesome. Because, you know, having, having a sound-treated room is the best. Um, yeah. I record myself in my walk-in closet. Uh, it's actually a fantastically, wonderfully quiet space. And then I've gone to some friends' places and just kind of recorded wherever. And you have to just be aware of your space. And even still, yeah. I've got I've got a few characters in the show that don't quite sound like they're in the same space as everyone else, mostly because of small room reflections. Like uh, there's nothing you can do about the room I'm in right now, which it's a little unfortunate that I'm here tonight, but it's where I'm at. Yeah. Uh, and so, yeah, getting rid of those reflections is really tough. But, you know, for the most part, I can kind of almost add reverb back to some other characters to kind of create a space because I'm not, you know, we don't see where they are. 
Uh, and for the most part, I can just make it sound like they're under a bridge yeah. or in a cavern or in a reflective space, which can kind of work. And is that something that, you know, the, the making them sound like they're in a place, is that something that you're drawing on from your film history maybe, or is that something that you've kind of learned as you've tried to make these audio dramas? Yeah. Well, I, I've been audio designing as long as I've been filmmaking. Okay. And so there's a, there's a few tips and tricks that kind of create the space, right? Starting with as clean of an audio as a, as as audio as you can is always super helpful because you can always add reverb. It's really difficult to take it away. There are some great tools out there, but they're not perfect and they can always leave some artifacts. But yeah, you can kind of play with your EQ and make things sound closer or further away. Things that are closer take on a bit more bass and things that are further away have a lot more high end, right? And uh, for those of you who are listening, which is all of you. I just moved closer <laughs> and further from the mic to create the effect. <laughs> and, uh, and going back to the thing that Mike said earlier about this room that he's in, that's unfortunate. It, it literally just looks like a white box. So imagine white walls, white ceiling. Yeah. Well, it's also the angle. I mean, there is stuff in here, like okay. there's a bed and carpeting and all that. So the, like it, it is actually killing quite a bit and there's curtains on the other side. It's just, there's nothing on the walls. <laughs> Um, but yeah, also with sound effects, a, a lot of sound effects are stereo. And so something close up will be in stereo, but something further away should be mono okay. because it's so far away that you don't really have, you know, that kind of perspective on it. Yeah. And you can kind of play with that. You can tighten up your stereo sound to mono. If something's going further away, you can play with left to right panning for a car going by and that kind of thing. Um, and definitely making all of your effects consistent when you're in a certain space, like some of my characters have been in bunkers, others have been out in, in the middle of the desert. And so those are going to sound like two very different spaces. And I make sure to, you know, just do some minor tweaks just to kind of keep those consistent. And in addition to the, uh, the effects that you're putting on the audio that you're recording, like the, the voices and things you, you do a lot with music beds and I think is Foley the, the appropriate term. Yeah. Well, Foley is, um, when you, when you're doing your own sound effects. Okay. Yeah. Um, so yeah, Foley is kind of like, not, not necessarily like special sound effects, like a bomb. You're not going to Foley a bomb. Yeah. You're not going to like use an actual bomb to make a bomb sound. Well, you're I just going to grab could it. If you cared, you could, you could, you could. And I've, you know, I've recorded like the sound of a gun going off before, but it's really tough to capture that kind of thing. But yeah, Foley is more like when you're putting in footsteps and, and, um, uh, clothing rustling and like, you know, uh, hair sounds and all the kind of things that you can, you can actually reproduce naturally and make them sound even better than they would if you were capturing them in, in like, in this case on a film set, you know, you have to go back and actually re-record those things to make them sound more real than the real one, if that makes any sense. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm imagining if you want to capture like footprints down a hallway or something, maybe it would sound better if you just had a mic really close to a table and you just stomped some shoes on the table with your hands or something instead of actually trying to walk down a hallway. Sometimes it can be. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes it can. I, I actually, footsteps are one of my pet peeves in sound effects because there are a lot of people that have their hands in, uh, in some shoes and then have a surface. Like you might have a, a, a wooden board with sand on it and then you just tap the shoes on it and you say, Ooh, it sounds like sand, but it doesn't, it yeah. doesn't sound right. It doesn't move right. And everybody goes way too fast when they record, uh, footsteps, <laughs> which is kind of nuts. And so I, I actually, I'll, I'll hang a microphone on a cable with my recorder in one hand and drooping the, the, uh, the microphone with my other hand. So it's nice and smooth. It just kind of, you know, it's, it just moves with you Yeah. and I'll record footsteps that way. That way you're getting real crunch on grass. You're getting real sound of like, you know, shoes on asphalt. Um, the problem is you get a lot of external noise as well. Uh, you get a lot more of the atmosphere if it's not in a controlled place, but you can kind of make those choices as you go. Uh, but you also asked about music and yeah, I'm not, I don't have any, um, I don't have anyone composing the music or doing anything like that. I am pulling from, uh, some music libraries and finding the right music is one of the toughest parts of this project. That's for sure. Where are you, where are you looking for that music at? What are those libraries? Yeah. So f for the most part, I'm using audio blocks, okay. uh, which is like sto story blocks, story blocks yeah. just that's for their music and, and sound effects. There's not much I haven't found on there. Uh, I do go to YouTube for sound effects quite a bit because there's a lot of creators that they'll put up a video and include sound effects and they'll say free to use. And so I'll just, you know, pull that down and use it. And then honestly, I steal a lot of sound effects too, because 
uh, I'll go on a YouTube video that's about motorcycles and I'll just pull the whole video, but then just use the audio. Snip and the it's, motorcycle bit. Yeah. Yeah, totally. It, you know, no one's really worried about you pulling their audio from a motorcycle and you would never be able to know it anyway. Right. It's not even like, it's nothing creative. It's just a sound effect. Uh, so I'll pull that in and that can actually lead to some very natural sounds because it's just, you know, it's, it's the real sound of a motorcycle. It's not something that someone's trying to create in a studio. And then as far as like editing all of this together, <laughs> I mean, you got, you have a lot going on in these, these audio dramas that you're, that you're building. So yeah, I, I feel like there's a couple of different ways that you can approach this, right? You can either go beginning to end left to right on your timeline uh-huh. or you can maybe piecemeal it. Like I'm going to do the narration now and then I'm going to do uh-huh. effects on the narration and then I'm going to put the music bed and then I'm going to put the sound effects and, and you're going to kind of layer it like top to bottom like that almost. Yeah. How are you approaching editing? So I would say about 80% of the podcast I did in three or four stages. The first one would be to take the narration and mix it like just lay out the narration with the character's lines and just get those in order because that's pretty easy, right? You just go in left to right and you pretty much get all of the voiceovers just laid out, but it's not timed and it doesn't have that, that right rhythm or, Mm -hmm. or feeling yet. Um, but by the time I start plugging in music for the right scenes, uh, it starts to come to life. So I'll do the music next. And that's when I kind of really start getting amped up on the story because all the emotion comes and I, I figure out the pacing and the songs I pull in might come with like, you know, a little music cue, a little drum hit or, or a crescendo that I wasn't like looking for. It just happens to be there. And every now and then they'll land at the right spot. So it'll actually make me like change my edit a little bit to fit the music. Or I'm chopping the music up to either make it shorter or extend it or trying to get two different songs to go together so that, you know, I get the feel of this with that. And so, yeah, that, that can be a project on itself. But all the feeling and all the all the, the the real drama and storytelling comes across once the music's in there for me. And then once that's done, I'll start plugging in sound effects. And the cool thing about music is it lets you know what sound effects you have to add and which ones you don't. How so? Because where I don't have music, you'll notice I get a little bit more detailed with the sound effects. Okay. You can hear everything when there's no music playing. Uh, you know, if, if someone uh, opens a bag, you can hear that when there's no music, but if there's music, you're not going to hear that kind of thing. Cause it would be buried under the music bed anyway. Yeah. And so once the music's in, I'll go through and start plugging in all the sound effects. And basically my rule is if I mention it, I want to hear it. And so not everything makes a sound of course. And I'm not going to do the thing where things that don't make a sound suddenly do make a sound. If you know what I mean? Cause they do that a lot in movies. Yeah. Yeah. I'm trying to think of an example, but I I feel like I know what you're talking about. Yeah. Like uh, a a good example is if you shoot a bow and arrow, the arrow making a sound through the note, through the air, it doesn't, arrows don't make sound in the air. If you were right next to the arrow, you might hear a, you know, a whoosh. Um, (laughs) But for the most part, you don't hear a arrow in the air. You hear the thong of the bow and then you hear it impact and that's it. But every movie ever does this crazy like whistle sound yeah. for, for an arrow. So I'm trying not to add on a lot of that kind of stuff. You know, sometimes you do have to do it. And there's a great book. I think it's a book out there uh, called Every Bomb uh, Ticks or something like that, or A Ticking Bomb. Uh, basically saying, you know, if it's an audio only project, if you don't have that bomb ticking down, the audience forgets it's there. Right. You know, so it has to have that deep, deep, kind of thing going on. I imagine, I mean, I, 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 I applaud your effort to not give sound to things that don't need sound, but also <laughs> given that it is an audio medium and you're not making a film, yeah. I feel like you probably do need more effects than you otherwise would. No. Well, in this case, you know, I, I've always thought about the sound effects as, as kind of the butter. The narrator is already giving the full story. Uh, and honestly, I could take the sound effects away and I think this would still be very listenable. Okay. Because with a podcast, especially with an audio drama, this kind of thing, you're, you're very reliant on the audience using their imagination to kind of fill in those gaps and kind of paint the picture in their own mind. And so in this case, you know, I, I, don't, I don't try to get 100% of the sound effects. I try to get about 50%. Just the ones that will encourage you to see everything in your mind the way that I'm seeing it in my mind. And then do you have like a a library of effects that you've just built up over the years? Like do you have hundreds of gigs of audio files that are just like tagged and ready to go, ready to be dropped in? 
Oh my gosh. Yeah, there's there's definitely a lot. Um, especially, well, back when I was first filmmaking, there weren't these audio libraries like audio blocks like there are now. Yeah. Uh, and the cool thing about audio blocks is you're not paying every time you download something. You you sign up monthly and it's unlimited downloads. And then it's free to use, right? As long as you've, as long as you downloaded it during that month, like you can use it yeah, forever. Yeah, you own it forever. Right, yeah. Which is great. The, the license is forever. Um, yeah, all you have to do is download it while you're a member, which, you know, it, it would encourage you to like download everything in a month if it was possible, but it doesn't even make sense. The, the price is so damn reasonable. But yeah, when I was first filmmaking, I would have to go into to online libraries and download and save them and like categorize them and keep them right where I need them. You know, I, I do have, uh, I still have a sound effects library from back then that I still pull from quite a bit. And it's significantly smaller than what I have by joining this this online library. And the, the library is still not everything I want, especially like the more violent tones tend to be lacking. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Like if I'm trying to do a battle sequence, you know, you can't quite get all the different sounds you want. And so I do end up having to Foley quite a bit and, and I have to go, I'll go to YouTube and I'll go to my old library and I'll, I'll jump on other free libraries that are out there. And then, you know, eventually if I don't get what I want, sometimes I just leave it out because it doesn't really matter that much. But for a lot of the sounds, I'm, uh, I'll find it. It's, if it's out there, I'll find it. Well, the podcast sounds fantastic from what I've heard. It, it it sounds really good. I think you do a, a great job. You know, obviously the narrating, I've already told you that. The the music stuff, the music beds sound really good. The the sound effects Thank you. add a lot to it. I, I want to know what your technical setup is as far as like the gear that you're using to make your podcast. So what kind of mic do you have? What kind of headphones are you using? Is it going into a mixer? Like what's the whole signal chain look like? Yeah, sure. So it's kind of funny because I've, I've kind of gone through waves of gear where I've, you know, I started with nothing and then I bought all the gear and, and I ended up on a pretty simple setup for the most part. So I record my narration and my voiceover and most of my sound effects, the ones that I'm foleying on a two track recorder. I just have a Tascam DR100. Okay. Uh, it's actually an older model, but it's, it, I wish they still made this thing because it's fantastic. I own two of them. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, uh, and the, the big thing is it has a, um, a volume wheel on the side. So you, uh, I'm sorry, a gain wheel on the side with a left and right track that you can keep separate. Okay. So I, th- I find that really important. Not everyone does. And then I just have a Sennheiser, uh, ME 66 shotgun mic that I record on and I do the sound effects, my voiceover and narration all on it. When I'm recording straight to a computer, like I am today, I've got a Behringer, uh, audio, What'd you call it earlier? Interface? <laughs> the interface. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so when I'm recording straight to the computer, I've got this Behringer 4-track interface, which is also uh, fantastic for doing live music. And the 4-tracks are very important because I like to do stereo guitar while doing mono vocals. So you need three tracks for that. And the funny thing is, when I started doing more and more podcasting, I did go ahead and get a little gear heady. And I, I got the, oh, what's it called? The big mic that everyone uses. The Shure SM7B. Thank you. Yeah, the SM7B along with the Cloud Lifter. And, you know, the, yep. the combination is like, what, 650 bucks it's or something cheap. like that? Yeah, the mic is not mic's cheap. 350 to 400 normally. Yeah. And Cloud Lifter is 200 bucks. It's, it's pretty nuts. Yeah. Um, and the, it's interesting because, yeah, I get a little bit more low end out of that. Which is great for that that DJ voice sure. when you're trying to sound like you're doing the morning announcements and talking traffic. Uh, but honestly, for an audio drama, I don't want that sound. Yeah. I want it to sound more natural. I want it to sound like it's three feet away, not three inches away. Yeah. And so this microphone actually does a lot better and it has a much higher, no, lower noise floor, which is kind of interesting. That SM7B, you have to give so much boost behind it. That um, for me, it, it just ended up a little bit too noisy. Huh. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, not everyone's going to experience that same thing. But for me, um, you know, as this whole filmmaker, going back 15 years to go back to a shotgun mic, which is super simple, pointed at me. Yeah. And I can get closer and further from the mic and it doesn't have as much of, a, of an effect, you know, because I'm, you know, 10 inches away rather than being four inches away. I'm not as I'm not super familiar with that microphone. I'm not, I'm not familiar with it at all. Is that a, a dynamic mic, a condenser mic? It's a... It's a shotgun mic. Yeah. So it's, what is it? Super cardioid or something like that. So it's got a very narrow field of, of pickup, a very narrow pickup pattern. Yeah. And so it's directional. It, it basically, it gets rid of all the sound that's coming from the sides 
Uh, and so in this case, my laptop that's right in front of me has a pretty noisy fan. And so I have it perpendicular to the noisy fan. So it's picking up my voice and rejecting the fan noise. Yeah, it's convenient. Yeah. I've, I've heard of voice over people using shotgun mics before. And it's, it's, it seems like, you know, the, uh, a good mic will sound good. You know, it, it doesn't necessarily yeah. have to be a, a radio broadcast microphone as, as totally. they say. Yeah. Yeah. All the mics just have, you know, different uses and it all comes down to personal preference. Yeah. Which I mean, it's kind of cool, but it also makes you want to try them all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Yeah. So you were talking about, um, the SM7B and the cloud lift are costing $600, $700, something like that. Yeah. I just interviewed somebody for this podcast and the episode's out by the time you're, whoever's listening to this episode, that episode is already out. It's with uh, Brandon Hall, who does Music City 911. He uses... What a great show. It is. It is a, a great podcast. It's a fun interview too. Cool. But he, he uses a $30 kit from Amazon. So... Wow. It, it comes with the microphone, a boom arm, a pop filter. Like it's got the whole setup and it was like $30. And that's what he wow. uses for his, his podcast. And you would never know because his podcast sounds fantastic, but he told me that. And my, I feel like my jaw hit my jet, my desk. It was like, <laughs> like are you serious? Like a $30 for, for the whole thing? Like, Yeah. It, it's pretty cool. I mean, I got lucky that I've got a lot of this gear for my filmmaking business anyway. Yeah. So, you know, and spending money on gear is never a problem for me. I'm just, you know, I'm a gearhead, <laughs> so I just want it all. But yeah, uh, the technology's come a long way. A USB mics can be great. Um, I've experienced some bad uh, microphones for sure. Yeah. And I am definitely an audiophile when it comes to, you know, the, the exact, the pickup, like the EQ pickup. That's not the right word, but basically... Um, how it responds to like low frequencies versus high frequencies. Yeah. And then With the dynamic range or y yeah, exactly. Something like that. And then, yeah, exactly how much noise it puts out because I hate having to get the noise out of every single file I work with. Yeah. Well, that's, I mean, that's terrible. The s <laughs> yeah. But I've had to end up doing that on legends of wasteland city because I've had so many different people mm -hmm. with different microphones, different setups, uh, send in their files and because they all have different noise and they all have different sounds. Uh, I end up having to like, you know, every single time I drop in a line, if they send over everything in one file, which I prefer, great. I send all that over to uh, Adobe audition. I normalize it and then I'll get, I'll do the denoise function. So I was going to ask you that you're using the, the denoise in audition. That's what you're using to, to do that. Yeah, I was doing, um, oh shoot, what is it called? Noise reducer or something like the noise reduction process. And I did not know that denoise existed for the longest time, but I finally like, yeah, if you go into noise reduction, there's noise reduction process, which you capture noise print. It tells it, you tell it what the noise looks like yeah. or sounds like, and then it'll theoretically get rid of it. But it has such a liquidy, like, like artifacty sound if you hit it too hard. Uh -huh. Now denoise is an amazing little tool, uh, that is almost perfect. And there are better tools out there for sure, but I haven't invested in any of them just cause you know, I can always throw in a little bit more music to hide right, right, right. the noise. But yeah, so for the most part, I have to go through that process with every single track and every, you know, sometimes every line, like some, I, I don't ask for them to send it in this way, but sometimes they send me each line as its own file, oh, which no. means I have to denoise every single file. So are you using audition then? That's your, that's the software that you're using to do all of your recording and editing? Well, believe it or not, I use Vegas Pro for video editing and I'm just more used to it. So I, so I actually edit the podcast in Vegas Pro Okay, and it has decent enough audio tools. Like it's got its EQ, it has a, a noise gate, it's got uh, compressors and all that, but I send everything over to Audition for uh, basically three different things. One is to do the denoise, to do the noise reduction. And another is to do declick because Vegas doesn't do any declick or anything like that. Okay. And then at the end, when I'm mastering, I'll actually go through and uh, send the entire thing back over to um, audition to do match loudness. I don't know if you do this on your show yet. No. Ooh, what do you, what okay. is this? So um, podcasts, there is a standard uh, luff and luff is like a loudness. Loudness uh, under full signal or something, right? Lufts. Oh yeah. Yeah, I'll, t I'll take your word for it. I don't even know. Lufs. Yeah, L-U-F-S. Uh, and for um, mono, 
I want to say mono podcast, it's like negative 17. And for stereo podcasts or music podcasts, it's negative 16 or 15 or something like that. Okay. Uh, and so I'll send the whole thing over. And basically what that's doing is compressing it so that your loudness is consistent throughout your entire thing. And I, I learned to do that about, oh boy, maybe eight or 10 episodes in. I had one of my listeners just send me a little email saying, hey, listen, your episodes are way quiet compared to other podcasts. And yeah. I was like, what are you talking about? Like, they sound great to me, yeah. but it's because I'm just cranking up my volume over here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so I've made it, I'm, now I very consistently, I always edit on the same headphones and I always have my volume set to 30 on my laptop. So 30 out of 100. And after I'm done editing, I make sure that nothing's clipping. I'll send it over to Audition and do my match loudness. And then once that's done, it's pretty much going to mean that every one of my episodes will have the same volume and it'll have the same volume as all the other professional podcasts out there. No, that's a, that's a good trick. Is that something that's built into audition or is that a separate like VST plugin that you've no, no. Yeah. That's built in. Okay. Yeah. I don't have audition, yeah. so I'll have to find something, uh, maybe something to use. I, I have a whole step sequence of compressors that I run my, my podcast through like the, the master channel it goes through like hmm. three per, three compressors to gently bring the signals closer in line. And then I have a, a limiter at the end of the chain that I use to kind oh, of good. crank stuff up a little bit. I think I'm usually in that, that negative 18 lufts range oh, when I, when I export. Yeah. I'm, I'm fairly conscious of the, uh, the loudness issue and I'm always, it, I feel like I'm, I'm like blind to it a little bit when I'm editing my podcast, just because I do have, the mixer with the separate volume knob and then the headphones have uh -huh. their own volume knob. And like, you could just, you could literally just like crank those things up and the signal coming out of your computer could be so quiet, but it sounds great right. in the headphones and you have no yeah, concept totally. of, of, is this actually this volume or not? Right. And I've noticed where you really feel a lack of volume is when someone's listening to the podcast through their car yeah. stereo, yeah. but on their phone through Bluetooth and for some reason, like in my car, when I listen on Bluetooth, it just doesn't get the same volume as the stereo on its own. Now, do you turn the, uh, the, when I do that, I have to have the Bluetooth all the way up to the max on the phone. So uh -huh. that it's sending yep, like same. the most signal same. and then the, the, the car volume rocker should theoretically be controlling it at that point. Right. Yeah. But, um, when they, when I got that email saying, Hey, you're a little bit quiet. I, 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 Threw my phone into my car, hooked up the Bluetooth, and I listened to, you know, my podcast and I listened to an NPR podcast and it was like, it had to be 10 decibels different or yeah. something like that, you know, Ugh. where if I was driving, the, the road noise was too much. I couldn't even hear my own show. Yeah. And so I, I went back and I, I, you know, remastered all those first episodes, lost a few listens, not a whole lot, not worried, nothing to be worried about, but you know, being consistent about that kind of thing has become really important. Yeah. It's a good lesson to have learned. I'm glad that you learned it. It didn't happen like 50 episodes into the podcast that you that you realize that. Totally. And that's one of the good things about like actually when you solicit feedback, you know, ask for criticism. You know, sometimes you just want praise. Sometimes when you're like, yeah. hey, listen to this thing. Tell me how much you love it. <laughs> right. Right. But it's also important to ask for real feedback and to not take any of it personally. And when someone tells you something, you know, it's really easy to be like, no, you're wrong. You know, like if someone says, you know, this part of your story didn't make sense. If you have to spend 10 minutes explaining why it does make sense, then it doesn't make sense. Right. And so you got to kind of keep track of what, what's making sense to people, what's not, what's working, what's not. And if you're not loud enough, make it louder. Right. So on that note, like wh what would you say is one of the most important lessons that you've learned about podcasting since you started? Oh boy. It's actually has nothing to do with podcasting. It has to do with time management and not over committing yourself to it because even on my, or my first shows, which are just interview shows that, that would be man area and the apocalypse postcast, even those to, to keep up with a one once a week commitment can be quite a bit of work. If you're not like, if that's not your, your life drive yeah. to create this kind of thing, right? If you're just doing it as like, you know, I, you know, I've got this business that I want to promote or, you know, I'm super busy, but I, I want to take on one more thing. It's, it's a little bit tough to keep up. And when I took on Legends of Wasteland City, or when I started it, I didn't really take it on. I put it up on myself. I didn't know that it was going to be five times the work to yeah. create less content. And 
you know, the first few episodes went fast. I was excited about it. Uh, someone else had already written it, so I'm just making small notes. I'm not trying to do the entire thing. And they were much shorter episodes. They were, you know, not even 10 minutes long. And as I've gone, the episodes have gotten longer. They've gotten more complex. I have a much bigger cast. I'm literally shipping um, recorders to California, then then up to Kentucky and all over the place in order to get, you know, some extra voiceover. And it all takes more time. And so I think just having realistic expectations about how much you can produce and what your commitment's really going to be and being honest with your audience along the way. Like, I can take breaks. But if I don't let the audience know, hey, it's going to be a little bit before the next episode, sometimes they get a little antsy and they wonder what's going on. (laughs) It's not a bad problem to have having people like waiting, anticipating your next episode. Oh, no, it's great. And honestly, uh, when someone gives me a push, when they're like, hey, when's the next one coming out? It honestly gives me the fuel to like, all right, let me get to it. Yeah. And uh, episodes nine and 10, the ones I'm editing right now, they were supposed to come out in September. And here we are. We're about to get into December. And I'm just like finally getting them done. And it's, it's literally just life happened. You know, sometimes that's just what happens. And I got to say, I was intimidated by my own project. I kept putting it off because I didn't quite have the time to sit down and do it. Yeah. And so, yeah, I'm going to take some, I'm going to take a little break. Um, and before I get to season two, I'm actually going to do some fundraising to see if I can get people a little bit more behind it monetarily, because at this point I've produced quite a bit and, you know, hopefully people value that enough that they'll actually like put in a few dollars so that I can pay some voiceover actors and so that I can feel free to take a little bit more time off of work. Cause I'm a, I'm a freelancer, so I can kind of make my own schedule, sure. but If I'm out there hunting jobs every day, you know, I can't produce as much. And so, you know, if I, if I can just get enough that I can say, you know, all right, so two days a week, I'm just that this is my job. Um, it would make a big difference. I'm not going to say that season two won't happen without it. It just, it'll happen a lot faster. Right. Right. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, monetization is one of the things that I wanted to ask you about this, this interview time has unfortunately flown by and we are, we are kind of at the, the end of our time slot. So there's a ton of questions that I didn't get to that I wanted to ask you. Is there anything that I did not ask you that you thought I would ask you? Oh boy. I don't think so. I I think, um, you know, for anyone out there that's wondering, Hey, am I, should I even, it's always tough to commit to a new show, right? Cause you're like, you know, committing to the time of listening to something that may or may not be good. And I'll just say, if you guys are into post-apocalypse stuff and you love adventure and you know, you like audio dramas anyway, but you want to hear one that's a little bit more amped up, definitely check it out. Absolutely. And let me know what you think and just know that there's a lot more coming. Yeah. I I think that's a a fantastic thing that people should do. I'm definitely going to listen to the entire story because it's been really fun so far. Mike, where can people find you? Where do you want to send who, whoever is listening to this now? I think uh, everything kind of centers back to the YouTube channel still. So even the podcast is still there. Uh, so that's just youtube.com slash the apocalypse post. And then if you want to search in your podcast app, uh, just look for either Legends of Wasteland City or the apocalypse post. Legends of Wasteland City will just have the audio drama and no after episode chats. So you can go from one chapter to the, to the next. Le, um, the Apocalypse Post will have both shows. It'll have the discussion show and Legends. Okay. Uh, but that's where to go. Awesome. And then if you want to see any of my professional work, you can go to MikeDarlingFilms.com. Excellent. Mike, thank you so much for joining me on Who Makes a Podcast. This was a lot of fun. Uh, I love your podcast. I love how it sounds. I love what you're doing. I hope that you keep it up. I hope you make season two. Looking forward to seeing you again in person at the next Nashville Podcasters Meetup. Thanks for, thanks for talking to me. Absolutely. And uh, yeah, Chris, thanks so much for having me on. This has been a pleasure. That was my conversation with Mike Darling, filmmaker, wasteland enthusiast, and host of the podcast Legends of Wasteland City, which can be found on all of the major podcast networks. You can also find Mike at theapocalypsepost.com. My name is Chris Cookley, and you can find me at whomakesapodcast.com. If you enjoyed this episode, it would be an enormous help if you shared it with your friends or left a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you're listening right now. And if you host a podcast and would like to be my next guest on Who Makes a Podcast, please let me know. Go to whomakesapodcast.com slash guest and tell me about your show. This is Who Makes a Podcast. I'll be back next time with another conversation with another incredible podcast host. Thanks for listening.